Beer is fantastic, but sometimes you just need the right tool for the right job. Today's video is brought to you by NordPass. These days, every service and every app require their own unique online credentials. Between banking, healthcare, shopping, education, work, hell, even my fridge, they all require their own online login. There's a lot to keep track of, both safely and securely. NordPass makes managing online passwords a breeze with their easy to use desktop and mobile applications, allowing you to store all of your passwords in one location that's easy to access across all of your devices. And thanks to NordPass's zero knowledge architecture, your passwords are encrypted before they ever reach their servers. What a novel idea. With our special deal, you can get two years of NordPass with one month free for a personal account by visiting nordpass.com craft or use code craft at checkout. But don't sleep on their business offerings either. Business accounts can get a three month free trial of NordPass by going to nordpass.com slash craft business with code craft business at registration. Again, that's code craft or code craft business. And thanks again to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Last week, we took our first look at this motherboard from Erying along with an Intel 11900H 8-core mobile CPU. In that video, I got a number of questions around topics like power draw, virtualization support, Linux compatibility, overclocking, and more. Today, I'm gonna answer as many of them as possible and hopefully give you all a better idea of just how great of a value this combo actually is. As a quick refresher, this is the Erying Gaming motherboard with embedded Intel Tiger Lake 11900H. Not exactly the catchiest of all names, but it does tell you exactly what's inside. It's a micro ATX motherboard sporting an engineering sample of an Intel i9-11900H Tiger Lake mobile CPU with eight cores and 16 threads. It has a base clock of 2.6 gigahertz and a max turbo of 4.8. Motherboard itself is running an Intel Genuine HM570 chipset and has a good number of bells and whistles in its own right. There are two DDR4 DIMM slots supporting memory up to 3200 MTS, a full-size PCI Express 4.0 X16 slot, a pair of M.2s for NVMe storage, one of those running at PCIe 4, the other running at PCIe 3. There's also an additional PCIe 3.0 X1 slot, as well as a PCI 3x1 for mini cards like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. In the last video, we took a quick look at performance and found that while the CPU is unlocked for overclocking, we could only exceed the rated 45 watt TDP for up to 90 seconds before clock speeds came crashing back down to earth. 4.5 gigahertz was seen during gameplay, while 4.1 gigahertz was the max frequency achieved during synthetic benchmarks. During extended load on the CPU though, that CPU frequency would drop all the way down to 3.6 gigahertz, although we never saw that slow down much in games. I was also unable to get the system memory running any faster than 2666, as the motherboard seemed to be locked into the XMP2 profile rather than the faster XMP1. So overclocking and TDP limits are the first area that I wanted to investigate after the last video. Thanks to the comment section, a number of you pointed to other resources for finding those settings in the BIOS. One of the best videos that I found was from Vincent Sank, and while I don't speak Spanish, he had enough detail on video for me to be able to figure out everything I needed to start pushing the limits of this board. Be sure to check out his videos on this board as I've linked them all down in the video description. A couple quick changes, and I was able to get the XMP1 profile up and running, and my XGP memory kit had no problem running at its rated 3200 NTS. Of course, I still wanted more though, so I swapped out that set for a set of Patriot Viper Blackout 4000 sticks. Unfortunately, even with XMP and even loosening some of the memory timings, nothing beyond 3200 was in the cards for us. In fact, even at 3200, the system was slightly unstable at times, crashing on more than one occasion in Cinebench, which is something I'd not experienced before on this motherboard. While I was eventually able to get 3200 stabilized and memory speeds can be improved over the XMP2 profiles, there are still some pretty hard limits to what the silicon can support, which is likely why Erying set the default cap with XMP2 profiles only. Moving on to the CPU itself, the Erying 11900H is cooled using a copper slug between the CPU die itself and the cooler of your choice. 
While that may not sound like the most efficient solution, even with just a 92 millimeter tower cooler, the max temperature we saw on this chip was just 82 degrees Celsius, which is well under the chip's rated 105 degree limit. But lower temps could theoretically allow the CPU to run even faster or at full boost for longer periods of time. So let's see what we can do to maximize cooling potential. The copper shim is held in place with four tri-wing screws on the back of the motherboard. Once those are out, the shim just kind of falls off the front, revealing the Intel Tiger Lake die underneath. The stock thermal compound was covering the entire die and appeared to be making good contact with the CPU, but I went ahead and replaced it anyway with some Arctic Silver 5. A bit old school, I know, but it's always been a reliable option for me. As for the top side of the cooler equation, I opted to go for the 140mm tower cooler in the Riven Oranos. This is one of the top performing air coolers that I've ever tested, so short of a custom water block, this should give us some fantastic results. Should being the operative word here, as even with a massive new cooler and fresh thermal paste, I was only able to get the CPU down to 72 degrees Celsius under AVX workloads. 10 degrees is not exactly the most dramatic improvement that I was hoping for, so maybe a little water cooling is going to be in order after all. Probably the most requested thing that I look at, besides Linux support, was removing the turbo timer, which would allow the Intel i9-11900H to run at its full 4.8 GHz turbo speed all the time. Again, referencing Vincent's video, I was able to do just that. At stock settings, the CPU was drawing nearly 82 watts at full boost while benchmarking, but again, it can only hold that for around 90 seconds at a time. After quite a bit of tweaking, most of which pushed the CPU far beyond 80 watts and into instant crash territory, I landed on a 75 milliwatt undervolt and an unlocked turbo clock with a max TDP of 72 watts. Even under Cinebench extended testing, CPU package power hovered right around 65 watts, and we managed the same scores as our early tests in both single and multi-threaded runs, and we hit a max temperature of just 69 degrees Celsius. Nice. There were a couple comments in the last video asking why I only benchmarked with Cinebench R15, and there's a couple reasons for that. The simple fact is that I have a much larger CPU collection comparing relative performance in Cinebench R15 than I do with R20 or R23, along with, in my opinion, what comes with more accurate results of what you can expect out of performance in real-world scenarios. Cinebench R15 utilizes AVX instructions, while the newer R23 relies on AVX2. While all modern CPUs do support AVX instructions, AVX2 is only fully supported on some of the newest chips on the market. Intel supports AVX2 on all 6th generation and newer CPUs, while AMD claimed support for the instructions in Ryzen 1000 and 2000 series chips, although it was half-baked at best, supporting only 128-bit registers, so it essentially ran AVX2 workloads at half speed. As such, you get more varied results in Cinebench R23 than you would get in R15, with R15 being a little bit more of a head-to-head, -head, apples to apples comparison. Testing out this engineering sample 11900H in R23 netted some very impressive results, especially with the turbo running at full speed this time. Single-threaded testing resulted in a steady 4.7 GHz clock speed and a score of 1576. Multi-threaded, the CPU was able to hold a 4.1 GHz clock for the duration of a 10-minute test, while scoring an impressive 13,620. On the used market, a Ryzen 7 1700X and B450 motherboard are going to run you roughly the same $150 to $175 as this Erying motherboard combo does. In this test, though, the 11900H blows the Ryzen out of the water, scoring a full 53% faster than the desktop CPU. So, in some tests that draw on AVX2 workloads, this is definitely going to be an amazing value. However, it's only because some older CPUs that are 5, 6, and 7 years old don't have the AVX2 instruction set fully implemented. Now, one last thing for overclocking. Like I mentioned in the last video, I'm not that skilled when it comes to per-core tweaking, and there's probably still a lot more performance in here if some are willing to take a crack at it. But 4.7 GHz in games, along with a steady and sustained 4.1 GHz in AVX2 runs, all while drawing around 65 watts of total power, I'll call that a win. With all of the speed questions out of the way, let's move on to software. More specifically, does this board support Linux? This one's actually very easy to answer if you think about it. Yes. 
Pretty much every single one of these knockoff boards are built using readily available off-the-shelf components. Realtek LAN chips, standard USB 3 controllers, Intel chipset drivers, and not much else. Any off-the-shelf part is almost guaranteed to have support in Linux, as they're designed to be integrated into a wide variety of devices, not just x86 hardware. Out of due diligence, I went ahead and fired up Pop! OS, and just like I expected, every single device was automatically supported. No driver installs or configurations required from me. Even sleep works, and it wakes from both the power button and from the keyboard, and sleep never works properly in Linux. So if you're looking for a Linux replacement workstation, this should be near the top of your list. Last but not least, let's take a look at the Earying 11900H when it comes to home lab use. Gaming and workstation replacements are all well and good, but can you use these to run as low power servers for NAS or other network services? Now, one of the biggest things that are gonna concern home labbers is memory capacity. Officially, Erying only supports up to 32 gigabytes of memory on this board. But according to Intel's ARC page, the 11900H can support up to 128 gigabytes. And seeing as the memory controller is on the chip, I'm gonna go with them. While I don't have a 2x64 gig kit to test with, I was able to run a 2x32 gig set of Patriot Viper Blackout memory at 3200 MTS. So those that need more memory in a server should feel right at home, even with only two DIMM slots. And finally, we come to the biggest question of all, does this support virtualization? And here's where things definitely get a little interesting. Taking a look at the BIOS, we see that both VTX and VTD are supported and enabled by default. VTX is Intel's virtualization platform, which allows the CPU to dynamically partition itself between host and virtual machines. VTD is support for PCI Express pass-through to a VM, so things like graphics cards or HBA controllers can be used directly by a virtual machine. The good news first is VTX works perfectly. I was able to install Proxmox, run a couple of different VMs with no issues at all, plus with the couple speed mods that we applied in the BIOS, performance was absolutely outstanding. What's not so great is PCI Express pass-through. Try as I might, I was not able to get passed through working inside of Proxmox. Now, Proxmox thinks that it's working. DMESG reports that IOMMU is enabled. Proxmox allows me to select a device to pass through to a VM without any warnings at all. And I even assigned the VFIO kernel module to multiple cards trying to get it to work. But no dice. The weird thing is, it looks like it wants to work. The VM will fail to start if you have something misconfigured, and it will successfully start if a device is assigned to it. It just doesn't actually follow through and pass through the device to the virtual machine. So things like virtual gaming machines with dedicated pass-through graphics cards or a virtualized NAS with a pass-through HBA are going to be a no-go on this board. But I don't think that immediately disqualifies it for use in a home lab. GPU pair virtualization in Hyper-V or NVIDIA's vGPU both don't require IOMMU to run, so you should be able to pass through 3D rendering to a VM using either of those methods. With only a single X16 and an X1 slot on this board, this was not going to be the enthusiast expansion card dream board anyway. But without diving too far down the expansion card and virtualization rabbit hole, there's definitely still some value to be had here. The Erying DIY Gaming Motherboard with embedded i9-11900HES definitely still wins my award for weirdest diamond in the rough that I've ever found. The CPU performance and low power consumption cannot be understated here, with all but the newest of 8-core and higher desktop CPUs looking like their decade-old has-beens by comparison. 65 watts of power draw also means the system can run silently in the corner of your bedroom or office, all while not acting like an overly expensive space heater. I'm impressed enough that I'm looking at putting a couple of these into my server rack to lighten up some of the virtual machine load on my file servers. A couple of these servers with 64 gigabytes of memory, a pair of NVMe drives, and maybe a Tesla P4 or so each, these would make for a very inexpensive replacement for some of the Haswell machines I still have running. And that's a project that might make it into a future video, so make sure you're subscribed if you want to see how they perform. As always, if you're interested in any of the hardware that I showed off today, make sure to follow the affiliate links down in the video description, as those really do help out the channel. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing as a second reminder if you haven't done so already. 
Follow me on Mastodon at Craft Computing at HostX.Social for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description and gets you exclusive access to my Discord server. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. And uh, happy Mixology March, everyone. Welcome to Mixology March, everyone. And today we are making a whiskey buck. This is gonna be very similar to a Kentucky Mule if you're a fan of all of mule drinks. Uh, but instead of using lime, this one's using lemon. For our rye today, I'm gonna be using a Rittenhouse rye bottled in bond, so that is a 100 proof rye. This is one of my favorite, fairly inexpensive bottles that you can get. And uh, I'm looking forward to this. So, take yourself a glass. They said Collins glass, but I think this one looks a little fancier. And we're gonna do two ounces of our rye whiskey. Then we're gonna juice half of a lemon into the glass. And finally, top off with four to six ounces of ginger beer. And there you have a whiskey buck. And now I get to make a second one. Double fist in it today. This is a drink I've not had before. Obviously I'm very familiar with rye and lemon juice and and obviously ginger beer, but this is just changing out the lime for lemon makes it something completely different altogether. Uh, and that's one thing that really attracts me to cocktails is the variety that you can get with just a quarter ounce of juice or a, a, a slight variation in a mixer. Um, this is, it's bright. Like, I'm, I'm picturing in my mind a scene not unlike a VD medication commercial where there's like a couple dancing through a field of tulips or some crap. It's that level of bright. It, it's... It's just an enjoyable drink. What's really funny is it's actually a little bit less tart, I think, than a Kentucky Mule usually is with, with the lime in there. The lemon's actually adding quite a bit of smoothness, and I think it's playing super, super well against that ginger finish. The rye actually takes a little bit of a back seat, and especially with the, the Rittenhouse 100, which is a fairly forward rye whiskey, um, I'm a little surprised by that, but overall, I think this is an excellent cocktail to add to my normal rotation.